Thank you. So I'm thrilled to be here. I was so excited when actually I talked to Sean. I was like, really? So you want me to just come pontificate about all the philosophies that I have? And which I have quite a few of them. And what, but I've been sort of fortunate. That's the good thing about being a CEO. You can just take all the, the stuff you believe and sort of infuse it into the organization and no one's the wiser. So, um, <laughs> so it's been really fun for me to, to really truly feel expressed quite honestly in terms of what it is that I do from an everyday perspective. Um, as Sean said that I'm at the YWCA Metropolitan Chicago and we have this amazing mission to eliminate racism and empower women. And we've been doing that. We're 140 years old. I love to say that because then it makes me look so young. We're 140 <laughs> years old. So we're a 140-year-old organization. So I often say as well that we're a 140-year-old startup because if you could think about it from a charity perspective, we are a real charity. Like that's who we are. That's what we do. But but coming from an accounting background, so I'm also a CPA um, who also likes Wonder Woman, and so I'm um, excited about today being the release of, of the Wonder Woman movie. So I will be there later this afternoon. So this is just like, I'm in a real happy space right now. I get to spend the morning with you. And then this afternoon, I'm heading out to see my girls. So I'm really excited. <laughs> so I'm really excited. But, but having said that, so I'm a CPA by background, and. Um, as Sean sort of alluded to earlier, for me coming in to do this work, I totally did not like this whole do-gooder narrative. So people would come up to me and be like, oh, you've moved out of corporate, the nasty private sector, now you're going to save the world and do so good. I'm like, not really, actually, we're a business and we're in the business of human services. So for me, it was less about sort of coming, to the private, or coming out of the private sector and to do good and more about I was always doing good. And so I'm, I'm going to sort of share some of those philosophies with with you that actually make me feel this way and, and have actually really manifested in sort of how we do the business of the YWCA, which is the business of human services. So some of you won't get to see some of these slides, but one of the, the, the quotes, I love quotes, right? I love quotes and numbers, sort of a weird sort of combination. But one of my favorite quotes is that I'm not a possibi or excuse me, I'm not an optimist nor a pessimist, I'm a possibilist. And that to me sort of is everything. When I first heard that quote, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. That absolutely describes who I am. Because I think that, you know, it's unfortunately, sometimes it, um, it gets sort of um, diminished when we actually want to dream and actually sort of express ourselves. So for me, particularly being an accountant, that, particularly, that particular quote sort of really grounded me in what I believe is sort of possible with the world and something that I thought I'd actually try to do. So my first philosophy um, that I'd like to speak a little bit about today is that everyone has value. And so theoretically, I'm an accountant. I should actually know how to value people, right? So, and we always say that people are our best assets. And I like to say, not really. They're never on the balance sheet, so not really there. <laughs> but having said that, I really know and really believe that everyone has value. And so for, for us, when you sort of <laughs> look at the manifestation of what does that look like. We spend so much time at work, which is really important because it's the way that I like to think of work. And one day we're actually going to have a better word for the word work. But it's how we use our time intellectually for the most part, right? Um, some of us use it more intellectually. Some of us don't. But, um, but it's the way we use our time to really express ourselves. And so for me, I know that the people that I work with at the YWCA, I, so we have 120 people that work at the Y. And often people believe that because they they're at the YWCA, it's a social service agency, so everyone must want to be there because they want to do good work. And I'm like, well, yes, and they also have skills, talents, abilities that they want to see leverage. So for me, I really had to think about, as we're trying to serve the world, how do we really focus on the people and make sure that not only are we helping people outside of the organization find their value with the work that we do, but we're also thinking about our people. So one of the things that we did at the YWCA is really develop a, what we call a people people first strategy. And so we really wanted to make sure that if we were going to um, empower our mission, it had to begin with our people. And, and if we were going to say that we need to um, help people uncover their values so that they can be you know, great contributing citizens, why would we ignore the people inside? So one of the things that we talk about is sort of our empowerment from the inside out. Um, and for those of you that can't see the slides, I love the movie Inside Out too, so I'm totally like a Disney fan. And so um, I thought that that movie said it all because it talks about, you know, what's going on inside and how that looks on the outside. And so that's the strategy that we've really adopted at the YWCA is that 
we can't take care of the people out there if we don't take care of the people in here. And so that's been part of this, again, this sort of manifestation of the value. But I, I have to say that I'm not the only one that thinks like this, right? So how many of you have heard of Shinola? Right? So for those of you who hadn't, Shinola is a company that started in Detroit, and it really was started with the mission of helping people um, use their skills and talents and bringing back the manufacturing sector to Detroit, um, really revitalizing that outside of the auto industry. And so what I think is so impressive about that, um, so when Shinola started, it was founded by the, the same gentleman that... Um, that founded fossil watches. So the reason that they started with watches is because that's what he knew how to do. So imagine that, being able to take um, your talent skill and apply it to something that you know how with this, the specific purpose of understanding that there are people in a marketplace that absolutely have value, but they need to find a way to be able to express that value as well. So to me, that's just been one great example of how someone has taken their mission, their purpose, their thought about sort of the value of people and really be able to integrate that into a private sector because my ultimate goal is to show the world that we don't necessarily have to be sort of bifurcated between sort of the social service sector or the impact sector and the private sector that at the end of the day it's everybody's business to advance society so we really need to look at how we do that in sort of the spaces that we sit today so what Sean didn't tell you is that this is kind of going to be a working presentation. So that might be a first, too. Um, so one of the things that we thought is that I want to hear from you all as well, because these are just Dory's ideas and how I pontificate. But would love to hear some of you talk about amongst yourselves, and then maybe we'll some, someone to tell us. Um, but really, what do you believe your personal values are that you get to express at work? Or, or maybe not, but what you think about in terms of what your personal values are and who you are. Is that okay? Spend a couple minutes doing that? Yeah. Not all about Dory today. It's all about us. It's all about us. So literally, so talk amongst yourselves for a couple minutes and then I'll ask folks to share some of their values if you don't mind. I love to hear other voices in the room and get other perspectives because I really do feel that when you meet someone every single day, like they literally know something you don't. It's just quite possible, right? And so when we get to, to hear from others, I really appreciate the fact that um, there's so much so many different perspectives on things and all of that matters to me. So, so as we talked about sort of this overall philosophy that, that everyone has value, the, the opportunity to be able to, to leverage that value and contribute that value I think is really important. And I think quite honestly, as a leader, that's my only job. Like I don't, they'll tell you, I don't run anything at the YWCA. My whole role is to sort of facilitate um, the environment and the conditions so that they can really, the way I see it, express themselves. And so one of my favorite quotes is by Bucky Fuller. And I usually slaughter it. So Bucky Fuller, if you don't know who he is, he's a humanitarian, an architect, a futurist, and really was just profound in his thinking. But his, his quote that I love, or one of his quotes that I love, is that you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And to me, that's just so powerful. It does a couple things for me. One, it anchors off the fact that when you want to change, for, when you want to create, I always say, when you want to create something else, we always say, what do we have? How do I change that? And I'm like, hmm, you have to presume that you're, you're sort of in a fixed situation with the tools that sort of created what it is now that you want to change. So I really like to focus on what's possible and build towards like a new solution. So instead of just fixing problems, I like to sort of create new solutions or create new things um, that really help me fulfill what I want to do because I have to trust that whatever we were dealing with or whatever got implemented in the first place, I want to believe that people did the best they could with what they knew, with the tools they had at that time. And so, you know, 50 years from now, people will judge me about wearing these tights and if I really did the best I could uh, to get dressed in the morning. But uh, so, so people are always going to be in the position to judge us for whatever we did. So my goal is to really focus on how I can create what I want versus fixing what, whatever people thought about what they had at the time. So for the YWCA, what does that look like for us? Um, well, it's interesting. So I just didn't get like this. I didn't wake up and say, oh, now that I'm at the YWCA, now I can implement all these new things. I've always felt like this. So when I was at the accounting firm, I also felt that I was doing good in the world. But again, because I had sort of a people first philosophy, one of the things that I did, they actually put me in charge of the Chicago office for our practice. 
And the first thing I did is I painted a wall yellow and put a hippo on it. And that's what you're looking at here. We, I'm happy to share the slides later. So, but part of our process is that for me, we were, so I was a partner at the firm, so we were just right downtown at 70 West Madison and all the partner offices were on the outside. So that means we were the only ones who had windows. And so then all the staff were inside in a bunch of cubes. And so when they put me in charge, I couldn't necessarily, they of course didn't give me the budget to totally destroy the, the floor plan. So I was like, well, we need some brightness in here. All the windows and if the doors are closed, you get no light. So I literally, we chose a paint color. It's like sunshine yellow or something. We painted this internal wall. And then the team was talking about things that they liked. And we decided that a hippo would be a perfectly appropriate in an accounting firm um, to put on the wall. And so that's what we got. So from a strategy perspective, and for me, from an expression perspective, it was all about what can I do to create a better experience for the people that I work with right now. And so since leaving the firm um, and being at the Y, we've continued that thinking. So you ask, why do I have a picture of C-3PO on my presentation? Um, well, part of it is that when we looked at, again, what can we do for the people inside the YWCA, the first thing that we had to do, um, believe it or not, we had not had an HR person. We had sort of HR administrators, but we hadn't had what I would consider a truly professionalized HR function. In, not that I've ever known. We've had sort of part-time people, someone to process payroll for us, but not necessarily truly tend to the needs of the people there. And so I found this woman who absolutely had the same and shared the same philosophies that I had about sort of the value of people and how the workplace is just an opportunity for people to come and express their value and contribute to the world. And so we shared that same value. So one of the things that she did from an HR perspective, she um, changed our whole process. I'll talk about it in a little detail later. But our, our people processes, as it relates to our performance management and what we do to um, recruit and all of that, we call it um, unleashing, so we call it possibility partners, unleashing purpose and potential. And so when she came in, she was our chief human resources officer. So now her title is our chief possibility officer because, again, we share the same beliefs of what's possible with people in the workplace. And um, so I, behind her back, call her our chief possibility, purpose, and potential officer. So she's technically C-3PO. And so that's, <laughs> that's, what, um, that's what that's there to, to symbolize the fact that we have someone really focused on how do we help our people truly unleash their purpose and potential because there's so much possibility in that. So have you ever heard of Askinosi chocolate? Askinosi, so good stuff, great chocolate. But the gentleman that founded Askinosi Chocolate in Missouri, he's so fascinating. So I happened to learn about Askinosi Chocolate because one of um, I'm still very much active in the CPA profession, so I sat on the board for the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. And my seatmate, because you go to board meetings, because we're accountants, we always sit in the same seats, and so this would happen for three years. We've never changed seats. And we actually I almost got into fisticuffs because someone took my seat one time. But, <laughs> but having said that, um, the gentleman that um, I sat by, his neighbor actually founded Askinosi Chocolate and told me all these wonderful stories about. So then we connected, and I was like, oh my goodness, he's amazing. So he was a defense attorney and really had problems really feeling that he was doing what he felt what he should be doing in terms of making the world a better place. And so he actually ended up founding Askinosi Chocolate where he wants to do good along every single um, process within the organization. So they, he hires ex-offenders. He buys the, the cocoa beans from uh, fair trade farmers and actually gives them a part of the profits. He then takes the packaging that the beans comes in and writes, wraps, it, wraps the chocolate in that packaging so that every piece of the way, and so he's not necessarily, he didn't set out to say, oh, I'm going to be very sustainable in my packaging or I'm going to create a workforce development. He's just like, I want to do good. So if I'm going to do good, how do I create processes and business processes that absolutely allow me to do that? So when I think about Bucky Fuller's quote in changing existing processes, he took the whole, I mean, first of all, he didn't say, oh, there's all these huge chocolate manufacturers in the world. How can I go against Mars or Nestle? He's like, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do because this is what I feel needs to happen in the world. And he's created an amazing company that's absolutely changing lives and the chocolate is good. And it's like in Missouri, who would have thought it? Thunk it, right? So it's just amazing. So he's one great example of, again, it's not about private sector or the not-for-profit sector doing good. It really is about how do I take something I know and love, which for him was chocolate, and who couldn't love chocolate, right? Well, sometimes it depends on chocolate, but um, 
but he took something that he cared about and what he wanted to and how he wanted to express who he was and show up in the world and created a whole company to allow him to, to be able to do that. And then, so we think about our people and many of the people at the Y, of course they, you know, they have some orientation to the work and so in terms of really thinking that it's, they're doing good but the work, but to some degree it was never enough in terms of the work we were doing. So one of our people um, saw that in one of our particular areas, so we provide childcare subsidies um, to working moms, um, or actually working parents, and, but with these subsidies, if they have a health issue, we can't, we weren't able to provide them subsidies based on the program that we're administering. And so she was very disappointed by this. And so she connected with someone in the Department of Veterans Affairs. And so we created a program called Tiny Boots. And what that program does is actually provides free uh, childcare services to veterans that are seeking not only employment opportunities, but are also seeking health services. So it was just such a great combination to allow us to um, fulfill and actually feel, make her, quite honestly, feel better because she was really finding it problematic to have to deny requests based on um, health appointments. And so, the, so this is actually the first in the country where there is a, a partnership between the State Department of Veterans Affairs and a local agency like ours to create this type of service for veterans. And she's just thrilled. Now she's getting called from like the Wisconsin Department of Veterans Affairs and looking at how this can be rolled out. The bonus is for us too, is that the child care providers that, that take care of the kids of these veterans are also getting um, paid, which allows them to use their extra capacity. So it's just such a win-win-win for everybody. But again, it came from her single perspective that you know, we're not doing enough to, to serve the people that really need us. And so I really appreciate that she was able to become even further expressed to create this process for us. And then this graphic here, um, Aaron Hurst, he wrote the, um, have you heard of the Taproot Foundation? So the Taproot Foundation is a professional volunteering organization, um, or a volunteering organization to tap into professional talent. So, he, so Aaron Hurst was the founder of that. And then he, um, later he wrote a book, a few years ago he wrote a book called The Purpose Economy. And what he's saying is that we're going to have an economy that is more driven by the individuals within the workforce that actually want to see purpose in their work. And we're seeing signs of that already in many different ways. But part of the research that they did for the book was actually through the University of Michigan. And what that research said is that it pretty much breaks down down, sort of a third, a third, a third. A third of the people, regardless of the job, regardless of the position, take a job because it's just a job. A third of the people do a job because it's a career and so they see the progression and it's something that they want to continue to pursue. And a third of the people see it as a calling. So whether you're talking about doctors in a hospital, same breakdown, or if you're talking about orderlies. One of my favorite examples is that, you know, orderlies um, at a hospital, that's hard work, right? You're, you're cleaning beds, you're doing all these things. But one orderly saw his job as a calling, it would actually go into the long-term care facilities and switch the pictures out so that the people in those facilities could have different views. So that he saw that as a calling. It wasn't just about um, doing just bedpans and things like that. He really saw it as a way that he contributes and takes care of the people that are in the hospital that need his support. And so that to me is a choice to some degree. That orientation around whether you're doing a job or whether you're doing a career or calling. Like I actually see accounting as part of my calling, believe it or not. And I actually have proof. Had I thought about it, I would have included this in my slides, but I would have overslided you, so that's fine too. <laughs> but I wrote a note to Santa Claus when I was 10 years old, 11 years old. So I know, don't judge me, I was old to be leaving in Santa, but it was a long time ago, so I was still a hopeful, optimistic child then. But part of what I said in this note, because I was, I actually was 11 and a half, so that's really bad, because I was almost 12. <laughs> and I know this because the note was in December, and my birthday's June 30th, so it's right in the middle of the year, so I was exactly 11 and a half. But having said that, what I asked for in the note were three simple things. The first was to make everyone alive today be okay. So a little of that social consciousness creeping in there. And the second, I want my parents to let me be their accountant for a month. And so I really liked math and I thought it was the way to go. So, and I was really excited by that. So that was my request. And the reason I know the date because I specifically explicitly told them I wanted to start January 1st, 1985. And so I was very explicit in this, in this letter to my parents. And um, the third thing I asked was for Santa to show me a picture because clearly I was getting some pushback and they did a little proof in there too. <laughs> so, so, 
So my only point in that story is that I've known since 10 years old that I can actually do accounting and make the world be okay, that those weren't, little did I know that they were going to make me choose a sector to be able to do it in. But to me, it really is an opportunity to think about where we sit with our work and is it a job for us, is it a career, or is it a calling, and then do the things that we want to do to reflect that. And so for me, even being at the accounting firm, at the end of the day, if I really care that people have value, accounting firm like you all, it's a professional services organization, right? So all I cared about is being around people. And so I can impact the people closest to me, which were my staff at the time, and clearly the clients we served. So time for another group exercise. So in this one, I want us to think about sort of what are our big ideas. So we talked about Eskinosi chocolate. We talked about, you know, what's a job, career, calling. So what is it that sort of really gets you excited and sort of floats your boat as it, as it relates to whatever you could do, regardless of pay, regardless of anything? Because that to me is where we can really open up the possibilities of who we are. So I want you to spend a couple minutes thinking about your big idea or what's possible for you. So a couple minutes to that. One of my favorite quotes, another, I, I have quotes all day, but this was a, one of my favorite quotes by Maya Angelou, and what she says is that a solitary fantasy can transform a million realities. So just think about some of the ideas that we heard. It doesn't take much, people. Like, I think people get so overwhelmed around thinking about all that they have to do, but it only takes one of us, like one idea. And if you have to think about it, and I do think about this a lot, so you, so, you're like, you really need to stop commuting or whatever you're doing to give you too much time to think about this. But I often think about everything that we have was absolutely created by one person's concept or idea. That's just a fact. You know, that something, every single thing that we had was a concept at one point. Everything, everything, everything. Even this little clicker, like everything was a concept. So you just never know the impact of any one idea or a single idea. So, when, so we actually have this on the, on the wall at the YWCA because what I like to believe that every single person within the YWCA is they impact a single life that who knows which of those lives that we're impacting including our own employees life will continue to create a ripple effect because that's what we all have the possibility to do. So when I talk about our employees and this possibility partner unleashing purpose and potential, this is, that is the, the theory that Maya Angelou talked about in terms of one person could unlock a million or change, transform a million lives. We think about that with every single individual within our walls. And so we want to make sure that we have to create a place for them that they can truly unleash their purpose and potential. So how do we practically do that, right? So for us, the first thing we did was got rid of performance appraisals, believe it or not. Um, what we said, well, a couple things. So my background, professional services, accounting, whenever we did a performance appraisals, it was specifically to um, get a merit increase or you know, create the career path. The reality is we're a really flat organization. If we don't get any more money, I can't give people raises. So why are we wasting our time, quite honestly? So for the YWCA, it was a very practical matter that we could say how wonderful you are, nothing was going to happen. We could say how horrible you are, nothing was going to happen. So for us, it was just a big waste of time. But the, the, actually, there's more people that have done research than just the YWCA that has also said, and ours wasn't research, ours was just like, why are we doing this? We're wasting everyone's time. But um, we, we've actually seen research that says that one company, I forget the, which company did it, but they sort of accumulated all the hours that they spent doing a performance appraisal. I remember it was just a, like a Fortune 500 that they literally, that like, I think it was like 12,000 hours or something that they spent of their people's time doing performance appraisals. And what they also found that everyone was demoralized after. They were um, really, no one really liked them. Everyone was uninspired after. And so they chose a different process. So we were looking at this data Essentially, we did the thing, go find data to support what you want to do. And so that's ultimately what we did. And then um, we saw that 64% um, that of employees actually wanted check-ins every two weeks. And then at a, uh, another percentage, 42% of millennials, um, actually wanted weekly check-ins. So we looked at our organization and said, what's really practical for us? One, the, the, the biggest practical piece was that we were doing this exercise that was really no benefit to anyone that really was not going to result in any change um, as it relates to how we participated with that individual. So we thought it would be more um, constructive with our time to actually call, what, to create what we called possibility partners um, and have conversations with people 
on a weekly basis. So if you are a supervisor, your role, we actually changed our job descriptions too. So we took the words out supervisors and reports to it's, um, it's supported by and champions so that we can really, again, reemphasize that your only point as a leader is to support the people that you work with and, so, and, and help them accomplish what we need to accomplish for the organization, as well as understand what they want to accomplish personally. So we have conversations weekly, um, and so I have six direct reports, so I actually meet with them every other week because they're busy meeting with their people weekly and all that good stuff. But it's, what, what, how are you? What's happening with you? How can I support you? What did you accomplish last week? What would you like to accomplish this week? How can I help you participate, or how can I help support that? And those are the type of conversations that our people are having. For us, it's been great. Like, we're not for profit, but every time someone left us, got fired, they would sue us. And so what has happened, we've actually used this as a process to counsel people out of the organization as well when it didn't work. So for the last sort of year plus that we've been really doing this process, we've had zero lawsuits, even though we've had to clearly transition people, as well as we've had people that I feel are, are, are happier. And we've really looked at this process and really opened the window for the conversation around, what do you want to do with your career? What do you want to do with the time you're spending at the Y? How can we support you in that? And we love it. We've had people to go on to do really good things because of the conversations that we've been able to have with them and help them sort of unleash their purpose and potential. Because again, my secret covert mission is that I don't care if you really work at the Y, I just want you to be a happy person in life because at some point we're all happier when everyone else is happy. It really is that simple, but we don't make it that simple. But um, I, so I'm going to pick on Fatisha. She's, she's the shyest amongst us, but, but she's a perfect example of that. She was actually doing some data analytic work in, in a database that we had at one of our sites. And and as we had different conversations, and good for Fatisha, before we really formalized this process, she actually spoke up and said, you know, I have these other interests. I was like, I know, because I follow you on Twitter. You actually are amazing. And, you know, before, when I first started, she linked in with me, and I was seeing, I was all in her business, stalking her, and looking at all her Instagram posts and her Twitter posts. I was like, this woman is amazing. And we have her in data processing? That makes no sense to me. So we had conversations. She spoke up and said what she likes to do now. She's our digital brand experience manager, and she manages our social media. She actually manages our e-boutique, our Y shop, and she's totally rocking at it. And so, and she does our design because she's actually graphically inspiring as well. So she does all of our graphic designs in-house until she tells me to leave her alone and go get somebody else to do it. Um, but, but I love that we've been able to tap in, like selfishly, I love that we've been able to tap into all of her interests and essentially created a role that fit her profile. Of course, based on what we needed done in the organization, but also say, what else you got going on here? And because I'm such a stalker, I could totally see it all. And I was like, oh, I saw what you put on Facebook. I saw what you put on Instagram. Can you do that here? It's been great. Um, and Brian is the same way. Brian is just a social person. I didn't have to, he doesn't have a lot of social, so I couldn't stalk him socially. But we just hang out a lot together. And I just saw how good he is um, with people and building relationships. So when I first came in, so he's in our development department. I first came in, his title was Major Gifts Officer. So I used to walk by and go, Major Gifts, because that's what he, <laughs> and I was like, that's so annoying. It's so not fitting. So now he's our Director of Inspired Giving, um, which is what he does. If you talk to Brian for two seconds, you'll be emptying out your pockets, I'm just saying. That's, <laughs> that's what he does. And so we wanted a role and a title that better reflect who he is and how he does what he does. We've had a number of people transition and leave us and we haven't necessarily replaced those people. The reality is you can't replace people. You can replace functions and you can replace roles that people do, but you can never replace sort of how that person does it. So that's where I say everyone has their own little secret sauce and that's what we really focus on. But my goal is to make sure that people are applying as much of their secret sauce here at the Y as we, as we can and then really figuring out how we leverage that to make us a better organization. And you think about it, that's ultimately what makes any organization great, right? It's, all, it's always the people. Like, yeah, you can have a strategy, you can have the coolest widget, ultimately it's gonna be the people. Like, if you take just basic companies, like say a Burger King and McDonald's, clearly we know that McDonald's has been, um, un, you know, put on the measurement, historically a more successful company than Burger King, but it's really just the people and the leadership and understanding who they are and what they're doing there because again, any concept, any strategy, any new idea is coming from the people within the organization. So my simple goal is to just make sure that they can fully express as much as they can. And when they're too, and when they've expressed beyond what we can offer, they are so welcome to find an opportunity where they can then go also express themselves somewhere else. So one, um, the person that managed our 
our Y shop before Fatisha took it over, she actually um, was loved fashion. We got her out of the fashion world. She was in PR like Oscar de la Renta, um, and she had moved from New York back to Chicago and was working at Neiman Marcus actually as one of the salespeople there or one of the assistant managers, but wasn't very happy doing that. So we're like, hey, we're launching this. I need someone with retail knowledge to launch this Y shop for. She came in, set it up and established that for us. And she really wanted to do more traditional marketing and get back, well, not traditional marketing, but get back more of a marketing path, career path for her. And so then she leveraged what we did at Y Shop and what she did for the YWCA to get a position at Nike. And now she's doing things and giving me free clothes. So it's awesome. <laughs> so I'm like, go, fur, go, <laughs> do what you need to do. But, um, but then now, <laughs> now Fatisha has come taken over the Y Shop and taken it to a whole nother level by what she brings to it and we have so we actually have so many more merchants in the diversity of products and how we engage with our products because that's what Fatisha brings to it and so that's what I think is possible when everyone sort of gets in and mixes up their own sort of special and secret sauce so that's a picture of our staff and that's not staged they are genuinely happy people that work at the YWCA <laughs> And so, but we do try to have a lot of fun because again, I view work as a place where human beings come together and express themselves and be the best that they can be and hopefully contribute in a way that's gonna to continue to advance the rest of us. It's just that simple, at least in my mind. So having said that, I have another great example of a human being that wanted to look at what she was doing and how she could better express herself. So have you heard of Rumi Spice? Rumi Spice? So it's saffron, they, they import saffron from Afghanistan. This woman is totally, if you watch, watch Shark, Shark Tank about three or so weeks ago, she was on there. She's actually from Chicago, so Kimberly Jung here in Chicago. But what she did, she was, uh, she was in the, I want to say it's the Army. She was in the Army. And when she was in the Army, they were, she was in Afghanistan, and they would destroy poppy fields. And, of course, that's what the Army does. They don't want you know, to support the drug trade, so they were destroying the poppy fields. But what she noticed there was that, well, as they were destroying these fields, that there are farmers that actually rely on these for their livelihood. So she was like, well, how can we support the economy for, or the, for the financial sustainability of these farmers? And by the way, also impact terrorism because we're making it possible for them to find a way to create a living for themselves and not be sort of swept into other things. Well, she figured out that they can grow saffron. And so she started helping farmers in Afghanistan grow saffron. And so saffron apparently gets way more money than poppy does. And so, so her goal is now to continue to help farmers grow saffron as well as help people understand how you can use saffron. Apparently I heard it was like the, like the rich man versions of turmeric or something they've been, or something she told me, but I'm like, I'll buy it, whatever. Um, <laughs> I'll do my part, but um, and still still sitting in my cabinet. Don't know how to use it, or don't because I don't cook very well. But but apparently, people who are professional shelves actually know what to do with saffron. Um, and so, but that was just such a great example. And there's Kimberly in the picture there. But such a great example of how she was like, how can I do like I'm witnessing sort of this. Um, these people get their living taken away, but I think that there's something better that we can do here. And so again. This is really an example of a solitary fantasy absolutely will transform a millions of lives both in, in Afghanistan as well as across the world as you get people focused on something more positive um, than other um, ways to do things that are not so positive. So, so she's just a really good example of that. And again, she didn't go to the army thinking that she was going to start importing saffron, right? She went to the army and that's now um, part of what she's been able to contribute to the world. So. That's all I have for you folks. To me, it's just really, really simple that I just believe that it's so possible, and, and that's why this name of this presentation is Be a Possibilist. I just believe in truly the possibilities of what is what could happen if all of us are truly focused on being who we are and taking that and just really like bringing it to the world in a way that's true to who we are, wherever we are. And I always say, too, when people are like, oh, I want to do good. I'm going to go work for a not-for-profit. I was like, if we're the only ones doing good, then what is everybody else doing, right? So we really need folks to really figure out what really makes you excited, what makes you happy, and really implement that. I know sometimes I sound like my Miss America speech, like, I just want the world to be a happy place. But I do, and I really do believe it's just that simple to do that. So I'm actually going to have you all participate in a little pledge that I take at the YWCA. So... 
stand, raise your hand, however you feel best to do that. We can participate. You're all looking at me like I'm so scared. It's not that dangerous. <laughs> it's not that dangerous. But I will ask you to, I know it's hard getting off the floor, at least on my knees don't work that well. So, <laughs> so but we're going to raise our little right hands because somewhere in America, somewhere, someone said that when you raise your right hand, it makes it official. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and do that. So we'll try this sort of repeat exercise. So today I serve the world. By being my most empowered self. I leverage my whole self. And appreciate others. For doing the same. By being our whole. Empowered selves. We improve the world. That's all I got for you folks. <laughs>